Today we're going to talk about lesions on the left side of the heart. talk about um, aortic stenosis or aortic valve disease and mitral valve disease both on which side of the heart the left side yeah <laughs> so these are the things of the nccpa blueprint you have to it's listed you have to know about aortic stenosis and insufficiency mitral stenosis and insufficiency mitral valve prolapse which we hit on briefly yesterday and um rheumatic heart disease that's all that stuff today and there are all the things below or the, the topics you'll see at the top of the slides we'll cover that on each of those disorders symptoms exam treatment and prognosis and follow-up okay so actually if you if you kind of fold the heart and turn it you know, all four valves are right next to each other they're not in a line like that that's very two-dimensional and there's looking at it from the front chest is anterior the back posterior so the um the pulmonic valve is right in the front. You can see that's the one. The pulmonary artery gets ruptured in accidents pretty easily. It's the thing, the most anterior structure. Okay. Things have really changed. When I, when I started working in cardiology in 79, we were still seeing cases of rheumatic heart disease and mitral stenosis. So I got to learn, I got to hear these murmurs and learn them really well. But that's changed a lot over the years because What's the cure for rheumatic heart disease? What drug do you think? The infection, penicillin. When was penicillin discovered? Like 44, I think. Something like that, yeah. But anyways, that made a huge difference. And now people, when they got strep throats, that treated it didn't go into rheumatic fever. So instead, we're getting older now, we have degenerative heart disease. So you're seeing a lot more aortic stenosis develop over the years than before and very rarely do I ever see mitral stenosis. So how do people die from valvular heart disease? They die from heart failure. So if they don't get their valve repaired, the heart remodels. And um, <coughs> remodeling is a bad thing. Remodeling means it changes shape. You destroy the connective tissue around the valve they block the valves and then the heart starts to stretch and the fibers get ruined and they get to a point of no return where they cannot cannot come back so they remodel and the heart failure you can also be once you start stretching the heart you can get dysrhythmias and you can have sudden death from that that's been addressed with defibrillators so uh, people might not die from that but once the heart fails it doesn't matter if you have a defibrillator or not if you have a heart that won't respond to the defibrillator and start beating again because it's failing then you will still die from the from the disease and infection is less often bacterial endocarditis but people when they get immunocompromised when they are chronically ill then they're that's more likely to have infection and, and die from infection so uh, understand these terms stenosis means it's blocked and the words insufficiency and regurgitation are the same. And that refers to a leaking valve. We'll, we'll start out with the mitral valve prolapse, which is the last thing we talked about. And it is congenital. Myxomatous means it, um, it's thickened like a, like a fibroma in the uterus, is myxomatous type lesion. So it gets, it gets a thickened, and because it's redundant, sometimes that's the word they'll use, or thickened, the valve itself prolapses rather than closing, so it bulges into the what chamber? Which one? Left atrium. Left atrium, correct. So there's a picture right on the bottom. 
That picture on the right isn't very realistic because the valve is not a little flat thing like that. It's got it's more domed because the papillary muscles pull on it. That's how valves open and close. The pressure changes and then the papillary muscles allow it either to go up or pull it down. So the uh, leakage is a little bit uh, different depending on what valve you're talking about. So if you have mitral regurgitation, the blood is leaking into what chamber? The left atrium, right. Now if you have aortic regurgitation, where do you think the blood leaks? Yeah, correct, the left ventricle. So sometimes leaking is into a ventricle and sometimes leaking is into an atrium. It doesn't leak back up into the aorta because that really wouldn't bother you at all. If you had extra blood that leaked into the aorta, so what? Go to the whole body. You wouldn't notice an effect from that. So try, try and keep your anatomy. You'll understand better as we go through the aortic valve stuff, but there's try and keep that straight where the direction of the blood flow is. Mitral valve prolapse, I told you yesterday that they might have palpitations, chest pain, or this the syndrome of excess catecholamines and get so type A personality. We joke about that, people that had microbial prolapse, you could sort of tell because they had all these things. But not always. And also, people with mitral valve disease, it might be associated with things like Marfan syndrome. Did you ever, anyone ever hear that, Marfan syndrome? Yeah, I think Abe Lincoln had it. Had extra long extremities and connective tissue laxity, double jointness, displaced lens, stuff, different things that can go with it. It's an inheritable connective tissue disorder, but also the mitral valve itself can prolapse with that. So when you see people that are really tall and thin and sometimes have pectus excavatum, you think of mitral valve prolapse. But it's not always associated with Marfan's. They can just have mitral valve prolapse and not look like that at all. So when you listen for that, you want to listen in the left lateral decubitus position because it's really hard to hear the clicking of the redundant mitral valve leaflet prolapsing into the The first bump is S1, which is the closure of what? S1 is closure of what? Yeah. And which is, what's the AD valve? The trick has been the mitral valve, and S2 is closure of the aortic and the pulmonic. In that order, the aortic closes first and pulmonic. Okay. So the click that I'm singing to you is after the AV valves close, then you have that extra sound of that little piece of valve going up. That's why I said oh, click, oh. And it's mid systolic because it's in between S1 and S2. What's after S2? If systole is S diastole, diastole comes after S2. So is it supposed to be quiet or noisy in S after S2? Quiet. There's no sound. It's quiet because the heart is going what during diastole? It's filling. So the AV valves open up again and blood flows from the upper chambers to the lower chambers. And that's quiet. It's pathology. Anything you hear in diastole is pathological. Children are a little bit different, but we're going to do I'll give you a lecture on pediatric cardiology during your pediatrics module, and we'll talk about a few different sounds that kids have. But for the, in general, adult cardiology, that's all we're gonna talk about as adults, this course, it's pathological to have any sound when the heart's resting and, and filling with blood, okay? Remember, diastole is quiet, and when is diastole, you just listen for the first and second heart sounds. Now, can you feel the first and second heart sounds in the pulse? When you feel it rotted, do you feel S1 and S2? No, because the heart feels the contraction only and it doesn't, you don't, you cannot feel the pulse waves made by the closures of the valve separately. It's felt as one pressure and it's felt as one pulse. Even though you get a blood pressure, that's not what your body feels. The body doesn't feel the diastolic. It reacts to and, ex and it's expressed as one pressure. Okay. But we can hear those sounds with our stethoscope, but in the body is essentially one pressure. So I can forget all that stuff about which is more important, systolic hypertension or diastolic hypertension. They're both just as important. 
and it, it comes out to one pressure onto the onto the body. So the mid systolic click is papillomonic. It's the only disorder where you have a mid systolic click is mitral valve prolapse. So if you see a test question and it has to do with, with a click, a mid systolic click, there's other kinds of clicks called ejection clicks. They come in the beginning or early systole or with S1, but a mid systolic <coughs> click is mitral valve prolapse. Redundant valve or uh, prolapsing valve and the uh, and the murmur of mitral valve prolapse, if there is a murmur, would come when, do you think? In systole or diastole? Well, there's very there's a few murmurs in a diastole. This one is after the click, because I think when is the blood gonna leak through into the atrium? When that valve is closing and some so it's gonna be mid systolic right after the after the click. So it's bump click bump, bump click bump. Bump, bump. Right after the click, you get a little bit of blood ejecting. Make sense? So far? Okay. So it's after the mid systolic click, so it's still in systole. This is not a problem of, it's not a problem of, a, of filling. Filling is in diastole. This is a problem during ejection. So when the blood's being ejected, when the ventricles, when the ventricles squeezing, the AV valves have to close so the so the pulmonic and the aortic valve can open so the blood can go out of the heart into the lungs. So when that squeezing, those valves close. This all happens pretty quick, in a fraction of a second, because you on the average you have one heartbeat a second, right? If your heart was 60, one heartbeat every second. All this stuff happens in one second. Yep. Are all mitral regurg murmurs associated with a prolapse and a click? Are all mitral valve murmurs associated with a prolapse and a click? No. If you have a stenotic mitral valve, that's a different murmur we'll get to. If you just have an incompetent mitral valve, it, that's just called mitral regurg and has nothing to do with a prolapse. This is a congenital problem. This congenital heart disease, mitral valve prolapse. It's a deformity you're born with of the mitral valve. So you don't always have mitral regurg with mitral valve prolapse, and you don't even always have the click. So you have to listen carefully. You put them on their left side, and you listen with your heart, with the stethoscope at the apex of the heart, and you try rolling on the back, you try having them stand, you have them try, trying to have them squat, and sometimes one of those maneuvers will make the click come out. And sometimes you'll hear it, and sometimes you won't. And sometimes the echo test will show it, and sometimes it won't. So you never know what you're going to get with mitral valve prolapse. And I don't know why that is, but it must be easier to see for some readers of echoes and that kind of thing. So. Uh, the test is the EKG because you want to see if they have some, they have maybe uh, signs of left ventricular enlargement or serious mitral regurgitation or dysrhythmias particularly premature beads. Definitely want to get an echocardiogram will tell you. If you hear the sound, you want to document what it is. You can get a Holter monitor and that monitor, that IZIOS thing that I told you about. If you have a whole lot of beats and you want to, and you feel like you want to treat it, you don't instantly, just because they have mitral prolapse, put a monitor on them. You only do that if you, you're worried about them. You, you want to see what the density of the of the beats are. Density means how many premature beats they have in 24 hours. So if they have a few hundred, that's not a big deal. We all have premature beats. Anybody ever hear their heart go, like feel like your chest kind of falls or like, or you might feel a real hard thump. <coughs> the thump is the beat after the premature beat when the heart had more time to fill with blood. Who's felt that, that sensation? I drink a lot of coffee, and may, you, my heart might flutter, be a little faster, or you might have a lot of those bumps. Those are premature beats. Those are those are benign, unless you have tens of thousands of them. The most I ever saw was 40,000 in, in 24 hours, and that needed to be treated. Okay, so we used to give them antibiotics when you got your teeth cleaned. What happens when you clean your teeth? What happens? What gets, what gets released if your bloodstream? The bacteria. The bacteria. 
because they make all those little cuts in your mouth and that bacteria so what what does your body do about it bites it off eats it all up you're fine so most of us don't get heart infection every time we have our teeth cleaned it would be such a dangerous person We don't want the heart to change from its original shape. We want it to say conical. Remember the shape is an inverted cone? So if your heart starts to look like a globe or a boot, you're in deep trouble. But if you treat a patient from the very beginning, from they start having elevated pulmonary pressures because of their, their leaky valve that's leaking blood into the left atrium that's making the pulmonary pressure too high, and you can get those pulmonary pressures on an echocardiogram. So if you put them on an ACE inhibitor, even though they're not short of breath, they're not sick, but they got significant mitral regurgitation, or, and it could even be just from high blood pressure, they're, they can get heart failure. It, a heart, hypertension is not a benign condition. So they could get heart failure. If you put them on a low dose ACE inhibitor that they can tolerate with their blood pressure, if they have high blood pressure, perfect. An ACE inhibitor is both a blood pressure medicine and it's for heart failure and it's for prophylaxis to prevent that. And if I had somebody that had a problem, I keep them on it for life, an ACE inhibitor. Yes, question. There's not a dose for mitral regurg. You give the you always give your patient. You want to know if they have high blood pressure and mitral regurgitation. You have to base your dose on which condition you base the dose on. There's not a, a cookbook dose. It's each patient is individual. What do they tolerate? I.e., how much can you give them and their blood pressure is normal? It could be and they're a little bit different. The different meds as to what the, their doses are. They change. So I mean, I I have my standard doses. I usually try. I'm not so interested that you memorize the doses as you know what the meds are for because you can look that up once you start practicing and you can't it's too much to remember so i mean i can kind of tell you what my standard dose is but so something reasonable anyways so you need to uh, memorize angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ace inhibitors they usually spell that out on the pants angiotensin converting ACE, they don't usually use ace and arb but everybody talks ACE and R. They don't say those that long word. Okay, so that works. You, you haven't had that yet. Did you, last summer, did you talk about the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system? You just you know what that. Okay, so it works on that system. So it affects the hormones, the kidneys, the adrenal glands, and the uh, release in order to maintain blood pressure. So blood pressure is we're going to do a whole lecture on hypertension in case study. So we'll go over that a lot more. But the heart's just a modified blood vessel. It started out as a blood vessel and then it got four chambers in it. So it, it is a very much affected by ACE inhibitors. And high blood pressure is not from the heart. It's caused by the kidneys and the adrenals, okay? The heart is affected by it. It changes from that, but the heart is not the generator of hypertension. So anyways, so either a really common one that's free at Publix that everybody should know is lisinopril. It was made from um, snakes because when snakes bite, they the um, they don't bleed to death. That's what they do is they bite them and then they vasodilate and become hypotensive and die. So when the snake bites the rat, the rat becomes hypotensive because it's so much of this venom. So they got those they got that stuff out of snakes and now it's it's uh, artificially made but that it's a very potent vasodilator. So can you see why it would be good for, hyper, for heart failure, for mitral gurge that's causing, mitral gurge that's causing pulmonary um, hypertension? Because remember those pulmonary veins that come into the left atrium, now the pressure's too high in them. We wanna, we wanna dilate those pulmonary veins so the pressure will drop and the heart will say, ah, oh, thank you. I can squeeze, I'll shrink down. I don't need my fibers all dilated. I can squeeze and the heart will work instantly better. These were miracle drugs. You got Captopril in early 1980s and it's just mushrooms since then. So after ACE inhibitors were developed and they are 
there are two and even three times a day medicine. Then came ARBs, and ARBs are the improvement, and ARBs cost a lot of money. There's only one that's generic called Losartan. And the way you can remember the ACEs from the ARBs is ACEs end in PRIL, P-R-I-L, and ARBs end in ARTAN, A-R-T-A-N. So our ARBs are angiotensin receptor blockers instead of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So ARBs block the RAS system at a different point in the thing. And then there was direct renin um, inhibitors, but those got taken off the market. So anyways, they're gonna be on an ACE or an ARB if they have a mitral, significant mitral disease. If they have trace, mitral regurgitation, normal pulmonary pressures, you don't have to put them on an ACE or an ARB. So that's the main treatment is one of those. Relu reduces preload and afterload. Did you talk about that last summer? Pre what preload and afterload are? Okay, I'm gonna give you a paper on cardiac physiology. I'll post that just to um, help you. It's a little bit controversial. People give all kinds of descriptions of what, this, what, they, what they are. I kind of remember it as afterload is, afterload sounds like aorta, and it's the pressure in the aorta, so it's the effect on the heart, the, the load that the heart ejects, afterload and preload, I think of as the load, this, this loading into the heart, i.e. venous pressure. So the, the blood that comes up from the vena cava and dumps into the what? Where does it dump? Right atrium. That's where preload can be too high, because if you have venous congestion, then you want to reduce that. So these drugs, ACEs and ARBs, reduce both preload and afterload. So they lower blood pressure in the aorta, so they reduce afterload, and they cause venous um, dilation as well. So they, they affect both fibers in the, in the venous system and the arterial system versus some other drugs strictly dilate arteries. A main one would be nitroglycerin. Anybody ever heard of nitroglycerin? You know, the tablets you put on your tongue? Well, the reason that people take that is because it suddenly will dilate arteries, i.e. coronary arteries. So you take those when you're having a chest pain and it'll dilate the corners versus meds like ACEs and ARBs will affect both veins and arteries and have tremendous effect, extremely effective, life-saving, can, can stop the heart from remodeling, they can prevent heart failure, and they are truly miraculous drugs and you will be using them all the time. You'll be using for hypertension and heart failure. Okay, so um, Dr. Cosgrove, Delos Cosgrove at the Cleveland Clinic invented the annual annuloplasty ring called the Cosgrove ring. It looks like a C to some pictures and that can squeeze the mitral valve closed so that the, the leaflets are, can coax, the edges can meet. So they, it's always better if they can put a mitral, if they can repair that valve rather than take the whole thing out and sew a new valve in there that has to be replaced after so many years and can get infected, a mitral valve ring is superior procedure. So that, that helped a lot of people with the mitral regurgitation. So in order to do surgery, you really need a good reason to do it. The patient should be symptomatic. We talk about heart failure, you'll understand <coughs> better what, how do you make these decisions about whether they're, they need surgery or not. You're going to refer them to cardiology, obviously, and pregnant cares for, for treatment of this. But you're going to recognize the symptoms. They're your brand new patient, the first time anyone's seen them. They're 60 years old and they've never been to the doctor. And they're short of breath and they're exhausted and, and their, their legs are swelling and they've got some jugular venous distension and they have hypertension that's been very poorly controlled. Most people, hypertension is not well controlled. You're going to listen to them. You can hear, oh, they got a mitral girdler. Order an echocardiogram so that you send them to the cardiologist you know what for. Because how, how are you absolutely positive that, that that's this heart failure from, you don't know for sure, so you order the echo test, get that back, it looks like we said, I think the cardiologist needs to treat them for heart failure. You're gonna work on their hypertension because they are gonna come back to you. When you send your patients to cardiology, they're still your patients and you're gonna manage them long term and take care of their hypertension and, you could, and you're gonna manage their diuretics. So you are going to take care of all this stuff we're talking about in this course. They're gonna take care of their hypertension, their heart failure, their anticoagulation issues, their dysrhythmias, all that stuff you're gonna take care of. You only send them to the cardiologist for a consultation. They're your patients. I hope all of my patients have a primary care doc. If they don't, I get them one because I don't wanna give them their flu shots and, and I can't see them every three months. Some I do, but I want them to go back to their primary cares and keep close track of them. So you need to know all this stuff. Okay? Set a pep talk for you. Yeah.
All right. Okay. Let's um, let's take a break before you might just uh, should look like you're getting overwhelmed. 